Hello and welcome to Thermonuclear Takes. Long-term listeners will know that this is a bonus type of episode that we like to do occasionally, which is a bit more free-flowing, a bit looser, and I try and cover a lot of different stories that are in the news, which are related to things that we've covered in the past. In a bit less depth, just to provide a little bit of commentary on major stories and flag up some stories you might have missed, alongside generally covering the issues that you expect from this show. Of course, what tends to happen is I then write the script and it ends up being really long and I have to split it into multiple episodes and that has happened again. So yes, we're back. Thermonuclear takes. Don't expect too much in depth and let's get going. So this episode, we're going to begin by talking about the vaccines that are starting to arrive for COVID-19. And I have to start off by saying it's pretty amazing that we've got to this point so quickly. Back in April, we released an episode covering some of the runners and riders for the vaccine. And then the time frame for a successful development of a vaccine was widely considered to be around 18 months from the initial vaccine design to actual deployment beginning. Even then, we talked about the fact that this would actually be a really rapid process compared to typical timescales for vaccines to be approved, the example being the five-year timescale for the development of the Ebola vaccine, which did set a record at the time. Well, depending on how you define the start and end points here, it seems like we've actually gone from at least a vaccine conceptual design to approval for clinical use in 11 months, from January to December of 2020 which regardless of what happens from now and any difficulties in actually distributing the vaccine, is a truly, truly remarkable scientific achievement. And I think really just illustrates what we are scientifically capable of if funding and efforts and personnel are made available, if things are made out to be a priority. Now, one major thing to highlight about this was that we mentioned at the time that many of the vaccine candidates were trying to use a totally new technology for vaccines that was going to be quicker to develop because it could be designed quite quickly, but has actually untested. And this is this concept of an mRNA vaccine. Well, the mRNA vaccine is no longer just a theory. Both Pfizer and Moderna's vaccines, which have announced results already and are starting to be deployed in the UK, the US and elsewhere, are using this new type of vaccine technology. And this could be really positive news because it actually forms a sort of platform that allows you to develop many other different types of vaccine rapidly in the future, which we'll talk about a bit later on. Now, we also have some preliminary results announced uh, for the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine and the Russian Sputnik vaccine, which both of them adopted a similar approach technologically. So in essence, as a reminder, with a vaccine, you're always looking to provoke an immune response in some way that is substantially safer for you than actually getting the disease. In the AstraZeneca and Russia vaccines, basically, in place of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, you have a more harmless virus that's modified to look a little bit like it, specifically to now contain the spike protein that's on the virus itself. This is then introduced into the body, which then hopefully produces antibodies that will bind to and destroy that spike protein as part of your immune response. And then this is intended to provide immunity to the actual virus as well. So specifically, that Oxford vaccine used a chimpanzee adenovirus, and the Sputnik vaccine used a human adenovirus. So we'll talk about them a little bit more later on. But since their mRNA vaccines getting all of the attention, let's briefly discuss how they work. mRNA is short for messenger RNA. It's more or less a type of communication chemical that cells in our bodies and in viruses use to pass little bits of genetic information to each other. It's a bit like DNA, but it's slightly more prone to errors in copying. Specifically, you can think of it a little bit like a recipe for producing certain types of protein. Your cells then read this messenger RNA, and it basically forms a set of instructions for them, telling them how to synthesize a particular protein. The mRNA is quite fragile and short-lived. Once it's been read, it's really only supposed to move you know, within cells and between cells. So once it's been read, the relevant proteins have been produced, it's typically destroyed pretty quickly. So essentially what you do to create an mRNA vaccine is to take a piece of mRNA from the virus that actually is used by the virus to synthesize part of itself say that all-important spike protein on the outside of a SARS-CoV-2 virus. That's introduced into the body, which then reads the mRNA and produces the spike protein itself. Now you've introduced the spike protein into your system, your immune system has lots of these copies of this spike protein floating around, it reacts to it, and once again learns to produce these antibodies that destroy the spike protein. It's then hoped that this will give you protection against the actual virus if you're ever exposed to it, because you'll have all of these Uh, capacity to create these antibodies that destroy the spike protein. That's how it's supposed to happen anyway. In reality, this technology has been proposed for 30 years or so, with varying degrees of funding throughout that time. In theory, the operation is as simple as I've described, but in practice you have to balance a number of different things. This mRNA molecule is fragile, so you have to find some way of encapsulating it so that it isn't just destroyed by being in the human body at all and it ends up getting denatured before it can provoke this immune system response. Then you have to find some way of getting the immune system cells to take up the mRNA in the first place. 
Then you have to find some way of getting the cells to produce enough of the protein to elicit a really strong immune response to the vaccine. You're not going to get strong immunity from being exposed to just a single molecule of the individual spike protein, after all. And you need to do all of this somehow while ensuring that your vaccine does not produce any sort of immune response or overreaction and that it's generally safe in the human body aside from eliciting just enough immune response to actually give you this immunity. So there's, of course, the classic vaccine dilemma of calibrating the dose and calibrating the vaccine to get a strong enough immune response that provides lasting immunity without provoking the immune system so much that it goes into overdrive and gives you these severe side effects. And there are, of course, also these technical barriers to actually getting the mRNA into the cells and tricking your body effectively into producing enough of this otherwise harmless spike protein so that you will develop this immunity to it in the first place. And the question about whether the antibodies that get made in this way will actually protect against the virus as well, even if they can destroy the spike protein. So there was obviously a lot of scientific uncertainty that shows up in this method, even though the method itself might seem fairly self-explanatory as to how it's supposed to work. And the trial data so far seems to be very encouraging on these fronts. One thing that's a little bit annoying still is that we're still in this era where science is first announced by press release, where it's apparently acceptable for companies to at least at first disclose a single statistic or two about their product without giving you all of the peer-reviewed scientific glory detail immediately. But let's get into the data that came out in the initial releases. Now, one thing you might be thinking is what happened to the idea of challenge trials, intentionally giving people coronavirus after vaccinating them to test whether the vaccine was actually effective? Well, there are some efforts towards that ongoing, but I think in the end, our pretty terrible handling of the virus across many countries has essentially rendered this idea completely moot for these vaccines. The point being that you want to compare how many people get sick in the control group versus the vaccine group, and you need at least some of the people in the trial to actually get exposed to confirm whether there is a difference or not. Well, millions of people have been getting sick, and enough of them have been in a vaccine trials for us to get some early statistical significance data on these vaccines. So, for example, in the Pfizer vaccine case, they have a threshold before they'll announce these results, right? They said, let's wait until we've seen around 100 cases across our entire trial before we're confident that there's any difference between the control group and the group that got the vaccine. So when they say that the vaccine is at least 90% effective, that means there are around 10 times as many cases in the control group as there are in the vaccine group. The real irony here, of course, is that it's much easier to get this data if the virus is spreading like wildfire, because the amount of time it will take for a few hundred people in your test group of about 40,000 people to get sick will be much less if the disease is everywhere. So one of the silver linings to terrible pandemic response is that it's good for vaccine data collection, I guess. So the Moderna vaccine, which also uses the mRNA technique, has a similar efficacy. Now, in addition to this, from the early data from Moderna, we see that around 10% of patients have some kind of side effects from the vaccine. 9.7% report fatigue, 9% have some kind of pain, etc. Um, Derek Lowe, the In the Pipeline blogger for Science Magazine and the Authority on Drug Discovery, suggests that around 10% of the people who get this vaccine will feel like they've had a bad flu for the next day or so, but the effects are generally short-lived. Now, another point that I would flag as well with this vaccine is that, still shockingly, there's not a great deal of certainty about how long the actual immunity to coronaviruses, let alone vaccine-induced immunity to coronaviruses, will last. People genuinely go back to this one paper that was published about the common cold decades ago as a major citation for this, where they intentionally gave people the same strand of cold twice with these coronaviruses a year apart. And it's sort of amazing that this one paper is, is still one of the major pieces of authority in this, um, although of course more stuff is coming in about SARS-CoV-2 now. Stuff was done on SARS in 2003 4 but that didn't affect a lot of people, and it's unclear whether the residual antibodies that people have actually mean they will retain immunity. Um, it, obviously they can't expose people to the SARS virus again who had it before, so they don't want to test immunity that way. The, the evidence that we have then suggests that you probably have immunity that lasts for at least a year. And that's what the vaccine companies are willing to say about their vaccine too, where it's effective. They think the immunity will last for at least a year. But we can't know for sure, obviously, because it's only just now been a year since the first people who got sick with COVID-19 got sick. You know, it'll be hard to say, for sure, if immunity is a more permanent thing, or fades within a few years, or whether it depends on the person and all this sort of thing. The immune system is extremely complex in this respect. Now, this obviously gives us a problem because there's going to be a long-term COVID management that we have to do. Um, the virus has spread too far, I think, to truly be eliminated at this stage, and a lot of people think it's likely that it will become endemic, a bit like flu, 
within the human population, and there'll probably always be some of it circulating somewhere on the globe, even as we vaccinate people. So unfortunately, particularly if this immunity doesn't last for many years, or if there are strains of the virus mutating that actually allow it to resist the vaccine, um, it may not be the last time we see COVID. So why am I focusing on all of the downsides like this when a lot of people have been reporting this as this amazing story that we have the vaccine and there's finally light at the end of the tunnel? Well, I think really there's been another quite significant communications failure at this point in the pandemic, and I want to try and correct it if I can, because I think we can all see where the news story might end up. For example, in the UK, when I wrote this, we'd vaccinated about 140,000 people. It's now up to about 350,000 people with the Pfizer vaccine. Vaccine actually requires two doses spaced around two weeks apart to be effective. So none of those people are immune yet, since no one will have got a second dose as I write this in mid-December. But take that 140,000 people. 90% efficacy means that 14,000 of those people will not be immune. And that, in turn, assumes that the efficacy profile is totally uniform across age, sex, pre-existing conditions, and so on. It could be, for example, that the vaccine is less effective on the group that's being given the vaccine first, which in the UK is mostly people over the age of 80 and healthcare workers. In that case, we would expect an even bigger fraction of people who've been vaccinated to not actually have protection against COVID-19. And the point that I'm making here is that we know what's going to happen, don't we? At some point, someone who had the vaccine but who didn't get immunity will die of COVID. And the newspapers will run with it like it's a massive story and the conspiracy theorists will run with that and say the vaccine doesn't work. We know this is going to happen because stuff like this has happened constantly throughout this pandemic. It will be just like in spring when they did run with all of these cases of reinfection that were reported, which mostly turned out to be faulty tests, detections of viruses that lingered in people and so on. You know, I remember in the early days of COVID, Lots of my friends were messaging me with these clickbaity type stories saying, you know, you can be reinfected with COVID twice and the second infection is more deadly and all this sort of thing. And I had to try and talk them down and say, well, there was flaws or lack of evidence in a lot of these stories. Um, and I just think it shows how stuff that might have some scientific validity or might be a genuine result or there may be some uncertainty about it or it may be something that happens in very rare cases just this anecdotal evidence gets turned into these viral stories and people like to shock each other and scare each other by sending them around and all this sort of thing. And uh, it takes quite a while for us to be sure scientifically of anything that's going on with this pandemic. And a lot of these stories then fade away and you don't hear any more about them. I think obviously what's also true is that at some stage, someone who gets the vaccine will die of natural causes. We're, we're vaccinating people, some of whom are aged over 100, if you follow any of those people around for long enough, some of them are going to die. And if we're genuinely vaccinating millions of people, some of them will get sick with all sorts of weird conditions purely coincidentally and not due to the vaccine within some weeks after they were vaccinated. And unfortunately, it's likely that some fraction of the people will actually have a genuine adverse reaction. Again, even with the safest vaccines around, if you vaccinate millions of people, it's not impossible that some of them will have a rare autoimmune reaction. This can happen even with well-tested vaccines. But the rate of these false side effects, where people are falsely attributing what's happened to the vaccine, will probably be much, much higher. Now, an additional caveat here is that because these vaccines have been rolled out so quickly, we have only been able to test data which shows they prevent people from getting sick. We don't know whether the vaccine stops you from being an asymptomatic carrier of the disease or possibly transmitting it to others without knowing that you have it, without having symptoms. As you can probably imagine, you'd need much more data for that, so it will only be clear if that's true, probably some way into this thing being rolled out. So all of this is to say that when it comes to news stories, you just have to think to yourself, anecdotes are not data, anecdotes are not data, anecdotes are not data. Inferring that something has caused something else is really very difficult. It's much more difficult than our brains think it is, because we have this cognitive bias where we like to link everything to everything else. How many conversations have you had with friends or relatives who think that they got COVID in, say, November 2019, where basically no one had it? Virtually everyone I know seemed to think they had it already, even though this was epidemiologically impossible when the first wave hit, because our brains love to make these connections. So many, many people will be making connections with events that happen and the vaccine and making inferences that you can't make, which unfortunately we know has happened before with vaccines uh, in medical history. Now again, I'm not saying that there's no risk of some side effects that haven't been observed in the trial. We've seen an example of this already, which was front page news, when some nurses had an allergic reaction to the vaccine. And no one can rule out the idea that there might be more people who are badly affected in the future for different reasons, particularly across the many different vaccines that are being deployed. 
But to be sure that we are truly seeing something happening as a result of a vaccine, you need data, not anecdotes. And this is why I'm dreading how the news is going to cover the rollout of the vaccine. It's already started. Um, It should have been fully expected that people who had a strong history of allergic reactions who have to carry EpiPens around might have a strong allergic reaction to this as well. That should have been predictable and people should have expected things like this to happen. But instead we weren't prepared for it. And I think this is down to a failed communication strategy. The authorities essentially really, really want us all to get the vaccine so that the world can go back to some semblance of normality. And they know that they're trying to handle a world where conspiracy theories, misinformation, especially about the pandemic, are about as bad as they have ever been. And in that context, they're afraid that any admission or emphasis that the vaccine doesn't work on everyone, and that it has side effects which might make, say, one in ten people feel pretty lousy for a day or two, they're concerned that this will fuel the fire of the anti-vaxxers and prevent people from getting the vaccine, and that this will scupper their plans for getting this pandemic under control. Well, it's understandable in that context that they want to paint this as a massive and totally unqualified victory and not even give a little bit of fuel to the anti-vax flames. But I do think it's a misguided strategy. I think it repeats the exact same mistakes in communications that we had right at the start of the pandemic. Listeners might recall our very first episode of the pandemic, where I mentioned that I'd bought some masks and gave them to the local A&E in February, episode in March. At that time, we had government figures on TV saying, don't wear masks and that they didn't work to protect you against the virus. Uh, We now know that this was because PPE was critically short in the health service and they wanted to avoid people stockpiling and taking away from supplies that were needed at the front lines. But the result was an embarrassing U-turn when it took until June for them to take steps like making face coverings mandatory on public transport. And I just think this attitude of concealing the truth from people, treating them like children and so on, it's infuriating because it doesn't even do what it's supposed to, you just blow up your credibility and fuel the narratives that are working against you. The misinformation ends up being amplified and it seems more credible precisely because your rosy picture turned out to be wrong and because you have to change what you've said so often. These sudden U-turns from masks don't work to now they're compulsory in the course of a day makes you look like liars or at best incompetent. So yeah, call me naive, but I think you have to level with people, treat them like adults, trust them not to panic and trust them to take rational decisions. Our governments refused to do that very early on in the pandemic, seeking primarily to reassure people that everything was under control and to keep the economy going, of course. And the result was thousands of unnecessary deaths and a prolongation of this crisis, in my view. And I hope that they don't make the same mistakes with the vaccine. Because the reality is that while the trade-off is not perfect, it's still very, very good indeed. The vaccine may not provide you with a 100% guarantee of immunity, but a 90% chance of immunity is obviously a lot better than nothing. And it may have side effects. But the other thing that has side effects is getting the damn coronavirus, and those side effects have proved fatal in nearly 2 million people worldwide at this point. And according to ONS data, you know, one in five people who get symptoms can have sickness that lasts for weeks, multiple weeks. So you'd rather get the vaccine than the virus by a long, long way, and really that's obviously what should matter. Now there are of course some more points to make about the vaccines before we move on from the practicalities and talk about some of the interesting generalities. The first is that, yeah, it's going to take ages to vaccinate everyone. For example, the UK has been vaccinating for a week and has managed 140,000 shots when I wrote this. Our first goal is to vaccinate everyone over the age of 65. There's 12 million such people in the UK, so if we're going at this constant rate, it would take three years to do them all. Obviously, we plan to ramp it up and do it a lot faster than that to scale up the rate at which we can vaccinate people after the first few weeks. So three years is not a real estimate for the amount of time it will take. But don't be surprised if the rollout still takes a really long time, because it depends on where the bottlenecks are. So for example, Pfizer made around 40 million doses of its vaccine, but that's being split between many countries. Everything is going to ramp up production now, so the actual manufacture may not be the ultimate bottleneck, but administering the vaccine could easily be. The Pfizer vaccine needs to be stored at minus 80 degrees Celsius. I think the Moderna vaccine has similar refrigeration requirements. And doing this stuff is not standard kit at all. Even in wealthy countries, not every health centre is equipped with that, and nor are there that many ultra-cold lorries that can cart these things around. For this vaccine, at least, that will be a bottleneck. If doses of the vaccine spoil or are administered ineffectively, it will cut down on the percentage efficacy of that vaccine. There was a story about this just today, as we record. Um, And so the people who actually administer the vaccine are also going to be a bottleneck. You know, the nurses and doctors that are available. Now, just as a comparison here, for the sake of being instructive, um, the UK has conducted around 50 million COVID tests. 
and the US has conducted around 50 million COVID tests as I write this. I personally had a couple of those tests, actually, from going to the doctors in the last few months. But the point I'm making is that it's a similar scale up, and in many ways it's a similar procedure. You know, you have to see a nurse, you go in one-on-one, uh, they do something quite quick, and then you're out again. Um, but obviously that's a bottleneck in terms of how many people can, can get those tests. And a similar scale up, and it's taken nine months since ramp up to perform this many tests, which is approaching one per head of the population. So, you know, these two things, getting a COVID test and getting the vaccine, are somewhat comparable, right? The duration of time to conduct a test is similar. Generally, it's similar to people conducting the tests. Um, There'll be similar logistics of where you can go to get one quite often. But then, of course, there are other things that make the vaccine more difficult. The testing apparatus is just a swab, which is much easier to transport around. It won't spoil if it goes above a necessary temperature and so on. You won't need two doses of the test. On the other hand, the testing capacity is somewhat limited by the ability of the labs to process the tests, so it's not an entirely analogous situation. But all of this is to say that getting through millions of people obviously takes a very long time, and it would not be that surprising if people were still being vaccinated even towards the end of 2021 and beyond, even in the countries that are wealthy enough to afford the earliest doses and have already started administering them and have a plan to do so rapidly from now on. So this is some of the negative news that I just wanted to say to kind of point out and do some expectations management for what what I think we're going to see in the next year with this pandemic. It's still going to be a problem for many months to come, and particularly as we move in the Northern Hemisphere into this winter. Um, The good news is that the early vaccines that are shown to work are all targeting the spike protein on the virus, and most of the people who developed any kind of vaccine figured that this would be the best place to target. So the likelihood is that since targeting the spike protein seems to be a goer, most of the vaccines will work to some degree or other, and there will be more coming as well as the ones we've discussed already. Obviously, though, this doesn't change some of the logistical bottlenecks. Even if you have three or four effective vaccines going around at the same time, there's still going to be the bottlenecks in terms of administering them to people and so on. And unfortunately, it does seem like the vaccine that has so far the least complex storage and transport requirements, the AstraZeneca one, is likely to be the least effective overall. Another positive point to make is that if you do prioritise the most vulnerable and your aim is to prevent healthcare systems from falling over and being overwhelmed, then it should be easier for the rest of us to return to some kind of normality before an entire nation is vaccinated, for example. And the final positive point I would make is that, of course, we should not lose sight of how amazing it is that we have several successful vaccines in such short order, and that we've already manufactured millions of doses of them, and this has all occurred quicker than anyone, including me, expected it to happen. As Derek Lowe put it, he said, quote, We're going to beat this. We're starting to beat it right now. An extraordinary, unprecedented burst of biomedical research, huge amounts of brain power, effort, money and resources has come through for the world. End quote. Now, whenever stuff like this does happen, you inevitably see a whole load of silly stuff. Who can be thanked for the achievement? Everyone's advancing their own ideologies, of course, and we see this with varying degrees of clumsiness. Depending on who you ask, maybe the vaccine is because some countries are amazing or some companies are amazing or whatever. But I kind of wish we could view it a bit more as a triumph for humanity against a common enemy because we have lots of common enemies that we have to face as a species at the moment. Poverty, inequality, famine, climate change, other existential risks, which we must also conquer together. So maybe getting used to the idea that that should be our aim here is not a bad shout. But one thing I would push back on is the whole... Well, the fact we have vaccines in record-breaking time is evidence that pharmaceutical companies and free market incentives are really wonderful. I mean, there was never any doubt that these private, for-profit companies have incredible levels of brilliant and highly talented scientists, who were mostly educated by the state, uh, wonderful lab capacity, and the ability to develop and trial new technologies. The only point I would make is that we know that those only reason that companies were able to successfully devote these resources towards tackling this pandemic is because, in many cases, they had public sector funding, and perhaps more importantly, government pre-orders for the vaccine. So we've discussed before how, for example, vaccines for SARS and MERS were being developed by some of these pharmaceutical companies initially when outbreaks first began. They would have been the first vaccines ever to be developed against a coronavirus. But these efforts had to be scrapped and abandoned in the private sector when the outbreaks faded away, because the process of actually developing a vaccine is fraught with difficulty. After all, we've talked about how 95% of vaccines don't make it to the end of their production life cycle, 
Uh, it might take years for you to develop them. And even then, you might not have that many doses you can actually sell. In terms of a product, is a vaccine really the thing you want to be focused on? For most people, it's a one-off medicine, not a recurring prescription. And it would be unlikely that anyone but a few frontline healthcare workers would be likely to be vaccinated against a disease that is actually successfully contained. So, for example, in the SARS case, once the virus went away, it wasn't clear how many people would ever need to get the vaccine in the future. The point I'm making, obviously, is not to bash the companies or the scientists who've worked on the vaccine, but simply to say that you know their, their work was only likely to happen with this guaranteed revenue from the vaccine pre-orders. Moderna got a billion dollars from the US government, Pfizer's partner company got 400 million from the German government, and Pfizer itself benefited from hundreds of millions of pre-ordered doses, ensuring that they would be at the very least reimbursed for many of the efforts they made in producing the vaccine. The AstraZeneca-Oxford vaccine came out of research that was being publicly funded years ago. The adenovirus idea and the vector development for a MERS vaccine, that was happening in Oxford before the COVID-19 pandemic. And I know because I considered being part of the clinical trial for that in exchange for money um, some years before, um, before eventually deciding maybe not. And of course, for many years, the idea of developing mRNA vaccines and the fundamental research behind that wasn't making anyone any money because none of it had worked. And so it all relied on a combination of government funding and drug companies being willing to take risks and eat a loss up front for this technology to be pursued. In a world with different incentive structures, though, who knows, maybe we might have had it even sooner. Maybe mRNA vaccines would have been a proven technology already, and they would have been considered less risky. Um, It's hard to say for sure. The upshot is that I don't think you can rely on these free market incentives alone to deliver the best protection against pandemics. And there's a few things that we're going to talk about coming up that will sort of explain why I think that we need uh, some serious investment in future pandemic shields and, and some ideas for how to do that. And I think that should be clear. Uh, Corey Doctorow made this case when talking about the Californian government's budget. They used to maintain stockpiles of PPE and ventilators for a respiratory pandemic. Some clever legislator saw it as a wasted line item on the state's bills and decided to stop maintaining them. Uh, This ruthlessly efficient cost-cutting, as as they saw it, according to the logic of running everything like a business, um, well, that works fine until you run into a pandemic. Uh, Then no insurance company is going to pay out or no one is actually going to be able to deliver you the PPE where you need it at the time that you need it. Um, There's been these incredible investigations into what's gone on in the UK with the procurement of the PPE, which has been outsourced to lots of private companies, and many of them did an incompetent job and got the wrong kit or charged these ridiculously high prices to obtain this kit. And, you know, that the obvious point is that the free market you know, can ramp up production very rapidly uh, when it's needed, but not before it's needed. No one is going to make huge reserves or stockpiles of PPE unless it's ordered for them. So you're never going to be able to get these things logistically um, at the speed that you would want them for disaster response. By the time that the private sector or whatever it is has a chance to respond, it's already too late for a lot of these things to be prepared. You have to prepare in advance, obviously. And, you know, people are happy to do this with the military, which is, at least in theory, never needed across many nations. They're happy to do it with nuclear weapons, which would kill millions if they were ever fired. Could we imagine that in the future we might divert some of that political will that allows us to spend this money to pandemic defence shields, uh, spare healthcare capacity, the ability to scale up responses if needed, alongside this greater public funding for drugs and vaccines to be developed against new threats? Just to drive this point home, although I'm sure no one is disagreeing with me here, there was a study that suggested that preventing the next zoonotic pandemic, uh, disease from animals, would would cost $22 billion a year, with measures including a much-enhanced regime for protecting forests, monitoring wildlife trades, surveilling zoonotic viruses for the next threats, and so on. I mean, (laughs) it would be cheap at 10 times the price. That should be obvious to everyone. The idea that we could prevent future zoonotic pandemics for less than the amount of money that SoftBank's Vision Fund will probably lose next year is crazy. For a start, I don't even think that investing in this stuff should be called a cost. It's an investment which will pay back with an incredible dividend. You know, you don't think of buying food as a as a cost per se. You don't think of it as discretionary spending. It's it's a necessary thing. We know from modern monetary theory that constraints on government spending are much looser than many politicians would have you believe, as long as inflation is not a concern, and there's no issue with spending on this sort of thing, certainly not in these quantities. 
In fact, the whole point of having a monetary system is so that we can provision ourselves to defend against precisely this sort of threat, which requires collective and coordinated action. And even if you're a diehard capitalist, you know, the point of a government, a minimalist government, would be to maintain the conditions that allow you to run your business. Plenty of businesses have found it rather difficult to maintain their business during this pandemic. Even if you're a diehard nationalist, you know, this is 3% of the US military budget for a virus that's currently killing people equivalent to a 9-11 every day. So frankly, the idea that we wouldn't invest in this prevention of this and other existential threats in the future is, is insane to me. And I think it's something that, you know, if we have influence, we should all push for. But even if you don't care for human life and suffering, you know, even if you have to assess everything according to a cost-benefit analysis, the costs and benefits here simply don't compare. The World Economic Forum puts the damage at COVID-19 at something like $10 trillion. I mean, we know we know that there's all this stuff is guesswork, basically. You can't calculate it. Um, people continue to die. The impact continues to be felt. And it will continue to, to happen for many years to come. But again, even if you take that $10 trillion figure, you know, that's a hit that is 500 times the notional annual cost of prevention. Even if the measures suggested that this $22 billion package only reduced the risk of it, then it's still obviously worth it, even by the cold econometrics of the thing. So on this topic, another really piece of positive news that's come out of this is evidence that the mRNA platform works. Because at least in theory, this platform can be quite easily used on any number of different viruses. It's no longer this slow, laborious case of developing an inactivated version of each individual virus to vaccinate people that you need to do anymore. Many viruses have mRNA, in fact most of them will, I think, to encode their proteins, they they probably all do, um, which will encode some specific protein uh, that is a good target for a vaccine. And once you've actually identified the virus and studied it, it won't be that hard to identify some good mRNA that would produce a protein that you might try this approach on. So the time in the vaccine development, particularly with a platform like this, is all in the safety testing. It's not in trialling and working out lots and lots of different combinations of uh, proteins and uh, adjuvants and all the sort of thing that might get your vaccine to work more effectively. No, it, it's all in the safety testing. To give you an idea, Moderna's vaccine candidate was already fully designed already on January the 13th, 2020. Uh, the first doses had already been manufactured in February. It's sort of something of this bitter irony here that we had the successful vaccine candidates the entire time, which will now be given to many people. Um, if only we knew then that we had these vaccines, uh, we might have been able to avoid this. But uh, this, this does mean now that we have this platform that you could imagine us rapidly developing mRNA vaccines for all kinds of viruses that have the potential to cross over into humans. Basically, you could imagine a vaccine pandemic defence shield like this. You would design the vaccines and conduct the phase one safety trials preemptively to respond to new viruses that emerge just in case they did indeed have pandemic potential. Something similar to this is already done with the annual flu shot, There are many strains of influenza circulating all the time, and we have platforms that can safely produce lots of flu vaccines. So scientists basically pick the strains that they think are most likely to dominate that year, and then when you get your flu shot, they give you a cocktail of those vaccines. Which is why the flu shots work more effectively in some years than others. It depends on the dynamics of this influenza and uh, how successful the vaccine is for the particular strain and all this sort of thing. According to Florian Kramer, the vaccine scientist, he says, quote, With enough funding, you could do the same for viral pandemics and indeed conduct phase one trials for the entire set of possible future outbreaks before any of them made themselves known to the public. In the case of a pandemic produced by a new strain in these families, you might want to do some limited additional safety testing, but because the most consequential adverse effects take place in the days right after the vaccine is given, that additional diligence could be done very quickly. So Florian Kramer suggests that you could do all of this for a cost of about 20 to 30 million dollars per vaccine. And ideally, you might do this for between 50 and 100 different viruses, enough to functionally cover all of the phylogenies that could give rise to pandemic strains in the future. He said that it's very unlikely that there's something out there that would not belong to one of the known families that would have been flying under the radar. And, you know, that's not something to worry about too much. In total, he estimates that the research and clinical trials to do this would be maybe between a billion and three billion dollars. And of course, the upshot would be that we would then have vaccines that would effectively work against the next 50 to 100 different types of viruses that have a potential to go pandemic. 
and we'd have a much better chance of having something off the shelf that we can scale up pretty rapidly and deploy uh, in the case that one of these does cross over into humans and start transmitting. So this would be another thing that we could possibly do to genuinely try and head off future pandemics at the pass. In fact, way back in 2018, in our Teot Wauke episode on natural pandemics, I suggested that it might be possible to invest in a bunch of vaccines for zoonotic viruses that might go pandemic as a sort of defence shield. Now, I listened back to that episode in light of this pandemic, obviously, and I think a lot of what I was saying was kind of naive at the time, uh, because I was a lot less familiar with pandemics than, unfortunately, we all are now. Um, But in essence, the basic point that arose from that series may be possible now, thanks to the mRNA platform. And the idea that we should be willing to spend a lot on prevention and insurance against pandemics, given how likely a future pandemic would be, I stand by that, obviously, because I think it should be self-evident to anyone who thought about it even for a second. And indeed, of course, everyone in the uh, epidemiology communities and so on was saying this for a very long time. And just as many of the developments that enabled us to make this vaccine this quickly came from the splurge of activity and funding and discovery that happened after the SARS outbreak in 2003 and 4, you have to imagine that we will never be in a better position to deal with the next pandemic than we will be following all of the research that is going to come due to this one. Even if we weren't convinced about the vaccine's effectiveness, just its safety... Imagine if we could take two months from discovering a virus to having a vaccine that's likely to work. That would be quick enough to give it to healthcare workers in regions where outbreaks are known to be happening. That could save countless lives and cut the duration of the next pandemic, if there even has to be one, by a long way. It could actually play a role in the initial containment, which is obviously when you have the maximum leverage against any new virus threat, rather than coming along after millions of people are already sick and the genie is out of the bottle. I mean, you know, I think we all know that the system that we're trying at the moment with lockdowns and uh, social distancing of the population en masse and trying to somehow manipulate this out of control spread of the pandemic is not the ideal way to deal with a viral threat. You want to deal with it before it gets out and infects a whole bunch of people. And the idea that we could actually have vaccines as a tool in our arsenal at that stage um, just makes the whole thing so much easier to imagine uh, how we might be able to contain future pandemics and avoid all of the, you know, suffering and destruction that we've seen in the last year. So the reason I'm really hammering this point is that I can see after this pandemic, you know, perhaps we might take public health crises and new viruses and so on more seriously if the flimsy austerity arguments don't win out straight away, maybe for a few years. And then maybe 10, 20, 30 years down the line, as it starts to recede into a more distant memory. We go a few years with novel pandemics being contained. People get distracted by other things and different issues. People might start to look at these line items in the bill and see how much is being spent on pandemic preparedness and pandemic readiness. And they'll start to chip away and cut down at the cost of these things. And we'll be guided by the notion that things are different now and our technology is better and we won't have any problems with viruses or the natural world anymore, which has served us so well this time. And I would just say to everyone, you know, we have to push against that and keep saying it is worth investing a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of resources into these things that have some risk, um, not not even necessarily a low risk, um, but that which could come along and have massive impacts, these tail risks that we have to try and avoid. Um, I think we really need to push against the idea that you can just sort of say, well, it's not likely to happen, and and get away without um, investing in it. Because, you know, this was the most predictable crisis in world history, Um, aside from possibly climate change, because we have predicted that and been banging on for it, you know, about it for decades now, and it's been predicted with insufficient action so far against it. But, you know, in this case, we have the track record. You know, we had SARS in 2003, MERS in 2011, these warning shots of coronaviruses that crossed over into humans. We have flu variants that cross over into humans every few years. We have Zika, Ebola, HIV, AIDS, all of these things. We have the entirety of human history to look at here, people, with recurrent plagues and pestilences and pandemics that have always happened. We know that we're playing Russian roulette with these viruses, and that, you know, in the past a few times we've pulled the trigger and the guns clicked. You know, we've had a a flu strain like H1N1 in 2009 that wasn't as deadly as it could have been. We had... Uh, SARS and MERS, which didn't spread as easily as we thought they would. You know, that's empty chambers in the pandemic gun. Um, 
where the virus wasn't transmissible enough or we could contain it early on, where it was too fatal to spread quickly. And it didn't end up causing a huge global pandemic with the massive mortality that we've seen so far. And that's the thing with Russian roulette. You know, you'll keep firing blanks until you hit the bullet. This isn't news to anyone either. Pandemics were at the top of the UK government's risk register before this happened. And they have been for years, which begs the question, why weren't we doing more to be prepared? Why was there no system in place that could surveil more than a few hundred people at the time of the initial pandemic? You know, why was there no contact tracing system for a new respiratory virus? And it's all had to be set up by default. Why was this research into these vaccines, you know, this sort of thing should be getting equivalent budgets to the military in a world where, you know, our major threats aren't great power wars as much as they used to be anymore. The, the nuclear age has taken that out of the equation. And it sort of seems to me like we haven't really caught up with that. Um, and we're still in this world where we're thinking of great power wars and how the military needs to deploy the use of force abroad or whatever as the main threats to uh, a nation, the health of a nation and its citizens and its economic life. And, you know, we know that the real things that we need to be looking at are these pandemics and all the stuff we talk about in the Teotihuacan episodes and, of course, the accidental risk of nuclear war, which is still a very serious thing. Um, and given that these are the things that the governments even say are their main priority, it, it's hard to think that we weren't terribly underprepared. And we need to keep asking these questions of why were we not prepared? And what could we do to be genuinely prepared next time? And it has to be a lesson for the whole world, because it's only a matter of time before the next pandemic ready virus comes along. And... We know that there's nothing that stops it from being deadlier or affecting different groups of people or having different after effects or being harder to you know, contain. Being caught unprepared once is bad enough, but when it's the most predictable threat in history, you know, in the modern era, that, that, that's difficult. But it has to be a wake up call for, for it to happen twice. It's just unforgivable, really. But the sad thing is you can just see it happening. Maybe we're good at first and we invest in this slack capacity in healthcare systems. We invest in PPE and ventilator stockpiles. We invest in robust surveillance systems and testing laboratories and swabs and people who are trained in this stuff to scale up and test and contain a new pandemic. So we aren't in this absurd situation in the US and the UK where we had no clue where the spread was. Uh, We were only able to conduct a few hundred tests at most. You know, we could have a robust global system. Maybe the World Health Organization gets reinvigorated with new leadership or new ideas or new levels of funding that's monitoring outbreaks all over the world. You know, we have these vaccines for the possible new strains identified and prepared. Uh, We run the drills. We have the plan of action that everyone knows about. We do all of these things that are obviously so worthwhile and so affordable as an insurance policy compared to the alternative. Imagine a world where we do all of those things and then time passes and there's no pandemic and our collective global trauma starts to fade and we kid ourselves that the pandemics aren't a thing anymore and that the de- the defense system then just dies by a thousand tiny cuts even if we continue to invest in nuclear weapons that we're not ever going to use or softbank's 99th vision fund or whatever it might be you can just see it happening and it wouldn't be the first time and i don't think we should allow that to happen but you can, you know, you can just imagine people saying all this stuff about, oh, these vaccines, this PPE, these ventilators, waste of money just sitting around in these places because this has happened before. And of course, in my eyes, this all links back to the many, many other fundamental and existential, or at least catastrophic risks that we face as a species. You know that we covered plenty of them in the Teotihuacan series, there are plenty more, and probably some that we haven't even thought of yet. And frankly, if one good thing comes out of this mess, I hope that people... Uh, and policymakers and politicians have been shocked out of their complacency. Um, And the people who called us all doomsayers and chicken littles and all that sort of thing will be shut up for a little while, and they will realise that actually we don't have a handle on everything. Uh, There are gaps in our defences against these catastrophic risks, and there's a lot more that we can do to try and make ourselves safer in the future. And you would hope, of course, that our governments would realise that the price of preventing problems is always far, far, far less than the price of addressing them later on. And of course, apply this to climate change and many other problems that are continuing to grow unabated during this time. 
But then again, today, as I write this, it was announced that for the first time, UNICEF, the United Nations Children Emergency Fund, is feeding children in the UK. Uh, meanwhile, £4 billion pounds is spent on relaxing stamp duty to ensure that house prices continue to rise, as they did this year, by 7%. And inflation, which our heterodox economist friends tell us is the real limit on government spending, that's at record lows. So are interest rates, which the mainstream economists say represents, quote-unquote, the cost of borrowing. So regardless of your economic framework here, you know, now would be a great time to invest in a lot of these things. Um, but you cannot always trust politicians to make wise, sensible or humane policy choices when they have already decided what is and isn't worthy of expenditure. The good news, though, is that for the wise people who do choose to fund these efforts, I'm convinced that we are going to have a generation of young people coming up right now who have been, in a weird way, inspired by what's going on, to learn about the science of these existential risks, about the science of public health and epidemics and viruses, and that they will devote themselves now to helping cure the diseases of the future. So this research funding and this preparedness funding will have no shortage of places to go as these kids learn more about what's going on. Just as we now have so many people who, like me, grew up watching the news about climate change and wanted to try and do something that might help in that effort too. It may be too much of a stretch to hope that humanity fighting off this virus will strengthen our immune system in the long run, even if it does have to occur at a truly terrible cost. But that prospect, I think, is about as close to optimism as I'm really going to get this year. And that's going to be the end of the first thermonuclear text episode about the vaccine and the coronavirus update. Sorry to do another episode about this pandemic. I will be very grateful to stop talking about it, as I'm sure you all will in the future at some point very soon. There's a whole bunch of other stories that are going to be covered in a forthcoming thermonuclear text episode. That'll be coming out very shortly. Um, But until then, please do take care of yourselves, your loved ones. You know all of the things that you can do. You can go to physicspodcast.com. The contact form is there. You can get in touch with us by email. You can get in touch with us via the contact form. You can get in touch with us on social media. Uh, You can donate to the show via the PayPal and the Patreon, where you'll get access to episodes earlier than everyone else, and all of that sort of thing. And of course, if you enjoy what we do, review us, tell your friends about us, burn us onto a CD or a USB stick and slip it into someone's stocking at Christmas, whatever it is. Um, All of that stuff is very much appreciated. And thank you very, very much to all of you who have supported the show. We have a new top donor. um, So thanks very much to that individual as well. And yes, I I just, this is a passion project for me, as you all know, it's something that I do uh, in whatever time I have available. Um, Knowing that some of you are happy to listen and coming on a journey with me is great. And wanting to do as much as I can to produce stuff that you're interested in and uh, cover topics that you think are important um, is what I'm interested in here. So please do get in touch with us and be part of the community. And thank you to everyone who has done those things already. Okay, enough rambling. Until next time, stay safe.